The children may be dismissed at this time for Children's Church. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. And let's skip that slide up there. Matthew 11, 2. Set this down to. There is a stool back here. I see what you're talking about. I didn't know it was there either. Well, it's a good thing I don't move around much, so I won't, I won't hit it. Uh, but I shouldn't say that, because if I say that, then I will hit it. Last time we were together, we talked about the challenges of navigating change. Uh, we talked about how uncomfortable it is to navigate change, but despite the comfort, we also talked about how overwhelmingly beneficial it was to the church then and the church now when we do so. And we saw this very fact by looking at the way the early church navigated change in chapter 7 through 12 of Acts. Um, and there's actually more that we can say about this overall concept of navigating change. And with this in mind, my plan this morning is to drill down a little bit on it uh, to one more specific aspect that is related to navigating change, and this is the managing of expectations. Again, the managing of our expectations. Um, in order to do this, we're going to begin by um, attempting to get a working definition up on the board of what expectations is. Um, and uh, again, the question here, what do we mean when we say expe expectations? So this is my best attempt at giving you a working definition. Um, I apologize in advance because it's not going to be perfect, and there are probably others out there that can do a better job. But for the purpose of our study this morning, we're going to call expectations this. Expectations are assumptions about how daily life should work and about what results should come in the future if we maintain our current practice. Again, assumptions about how daily life is just supposed to work and how, excuse me, and about what results should come in the future if we maintain doing things the way they're supposed to be, that kind of thing. That's what we mean by expectations. Now, some of these assumptions are more universally accepted and are easy to maintain. For example, uh, some, an example of expectations might be true friends respect you and never talk bad about you behind your back. An expectation would be a true friend wouldn't talk about me behind my back. Sound like a realistic expectation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, another expectation would be physical or emotional abuse are never justified for any reason. And they're, they're just a basic expectation across the board, these things are not justified for any reason. Um, you won't find much objection to these sorts of expectations. These are things that we can kind of, on both sides, agree on most of the time uh, in the world. However, the vast majority of our expectations are not universal. They are more subjective. That is to say, they are based upon our personal feelings and preferences. And let me give you some examples of those. Um, for a good example would be the uh, belief and expectation that laundry isn't done until it's folded and put away. How many of you live under that expectation? Laundry ain't done until it's folded and put away. Thank you. Um, also, another expectation, um, five minutes late is still technically on time because the whole world operates under a universal principle that there's this grace period of five to ten minutes for appointments. Uh, you ever meet those people that, eh, five to ten minutes late still on time because there's like this grace period that we all understand. Those are expectations. Those are like principles of the way the world's supposed to work that we kind of, they kind of drive us and inform our decisions. Um, now, expectations are all well and good as long as those around you share those expectations. But when the expectations differ, that is when we get into big problems and we get into big problems quickly. For example, a universal five to 10 minute grace period is great until you start working with someone who views on time as five to 10 minutes early. Um, and I don't mind saying that uh, Holly and I have different views on that. I am one of those five to 10 minutes early is on time. And I, not so much her, I think her, her mom might have been more that way than she was, but uh, oh, I hope she's not watching this live stream right now. But, uh, but uh, I did, just thought of that. But there are people out there who feel like, ah, you know, even if you're five minutes late, it's no big deal, it's just a grace period. And when you have those two personalities in the same room, there can be tension, there can be conflict because the expectations are different. 
Also, insisting that laundry must be folded and put away is great until you are living with someone who puts their clothes on in the morning by pulling them out of the basket and kind of shaking them off and putting them on. You know what I'm saying? You, you've been around that. Those, those are both legitimate personal expectations that are based upon preferences. But when you get them in the same room and living together, there can be issues. There can be problems. Believe it or not, relationships are strained and relationships even break down over issues like these. And this is because all relationships are based upon satisfied expectations. They flourish. What I, mean, what I mean by this is that they flourish when expectations are satisfied and they break down when expectations are not met. And with this in mind, maintaining relationships over a lifetime necessitates the management of our expectations. If we can't make adjustments in our expectations from time to time, we will be isolated and lonely people. If we find ourselves living with someone who, who pulls their clothes out of the basket rather than folding them and we can't adjust our expectations a little bit, we're never gonna be, it's, we're gonna be a lot lonelier people if we can't learn to manage that a little bit. And as it turns out, our relationship with the Lord works the same way. Would you believe me if I told you that? It actually works the same way. Our relationship with the Lord is a relationship. And with that in mind, there are expectations that we need to manage in order to stay in that relationship with him. And if we can't manage our expectations with, of Christ and his kingdom, we will not be able to persevere with God. And I'm going to say it again just to be clear. If we can't manage our expectations, we will not be able to persevere with God. We will fall away. We will walk away from him eventually if we can't learn to manage our expectations of Christ and his kingdom. Now, in our last study, we saw the early church come right up against this challenge because they had expectations. We brought them out, uh, but I'll just briefly mention them and highlight them. For example, they expected the Jerusalem church to be the mother church and the most prominent and influential church. They expected that. They also expected that Gentiles should become Jews be before they become Christians. Again, these are expectations that, not, that everybody who was a believer at that time held, including the apostles themselves. And these expectations were broken when the church in Antioch uh, became more prominent and even overshadowed the church in Jerusalem, and when Gentiles were able to be saved and included into God's kingdom, as they were without becoming Jews. Uh, these were struggles for them. These involved the managing of their expectations, but they persevered and came through this stronger and better because they learned to manage them and they learned to adjust and to figure things out as God led them through the process. Now, I share all of this because the same is still true today. The church is still changing, and God is still doing new things. And as a result, our expectation of Christ and his kingdom will be unmet from time to time. There are going to be times where our expectations of Christ and his kingdom are not going to be met. And when this happens, we must manage our expectations in order to persevere with God. And of course, of course, this is going to be hard. But the good news is that God gives us a really interesting example of how to manage expectation in the book of Matthew chapter 11. First, we're going to read this encounter. It, by the way, this encounter is between Jesus and John the Baptist. First, we're going to read this encounter, and then we'll make our observations of it following. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 2 through 19 together, okay? So follow along with me as I read. Now, when John, well imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or should we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to him, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. As these men were going away, Jesus, be Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, 
among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet one of the one, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. There's a lot there, but it's all related, okay? It's all surrounding this account or this this interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist. Uh, and we can make four observations regarding John the Baptist following these, okay? So follow along as I put these up on the board for you. Uh, four observations. First, John was offended by Jesus. And by the way, we're going to step right through the text in order. Um, we're not going to be jumping around. We're going to step right through. But in verses 2 through 3, we see that John was offended by Jesus. And this is confirmed in verse 6. If you want to look just ahead just a little bit in verse 6, it says, And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. To be clear, he's addressing John the Baptist there. John the Baptist was offended by Jesus. At this time, John was in prison. He was put there by Herod Antipas for speaking out against Herod's adulterous and incestuous marriage. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail. I'm not going to go into any detail about this with you today. Um, mostly because it doesn't really relate to what we're talking about now. But also because I go into a ton of detail about this in a previous message about two years ago. Um, it's the one where I broke down the family and, 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 and stuff like that. Many of you probably remember that and were asking questions. But um, I will put that message in the um, description of this video. So for those of you who want to know more details about how Herod, or excuse me, how John the Baptist got into this situation, there is a ton of information there, and I've laid it all out for you, and I'll, I'll put the link there for those who are, who are interested in that. But all we're really concerned with this morning is that John is the forerunner of Jesus. And this is the same John the Baptist who was preaching, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's bringing people from all over the nation. There's a huge revival. They're being baptized. This same John the Baptist who had this incredible ministry is here in this text sending his representatives to ask Jesus, are you really even the Messiah? Do you guys ever read this and go, huh? You know, this is like the last time we really see him. This is the way he goes out, pretty much. And this is what he does. He sends his disciples to Jesus and said, are you really the guy? After that incredible ministry. How many of you find that shocking? just blown away by it. What's going on here? Well, when you stop and think about it, it makes sense. John has spent years preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he has called for people to repent and receive it. The kingdom of God is at hand. Come now, repent, get ready, because it's coming. And by the way, if you don't repent and get ready, judgment is coming by that same kingdom. For those who are obstinate, for those who want to remain in their sins, they're going to be swept away in judgment, so repent. God's kingdom is at hand. He preached that right along and had many baptisms and great revival as a result. And yet here he is at this moment languishing in prison for speaking out against sin in Herod's life that was public. And Herod, by the way, is still prospering along with his wife. And oh, by the way, this kingdom thing about the kingdom being at hand, Jesus came. He's been on the scene for a little while now. He doesn't seem to really be bringing this kingdom along the way he thought he would. It's kind of moving slow. It's kind of not moving at all sometimes. What's going on here? He's confused. Does that make sense? And so John had expectations in his mind as he was preaching the message and following the Lord about the way this all was going to go down. And there's nothing about his experience right now that is matching up with his expectations. Does that make sense? And so that's why he's asking, are you really even the guy? He's so thrown off by it, but he, he, he doesn't even, he's doubting. He's offended. And the reason that I share this to begin with is what we learn here is that everyone 
will experience this from time to time. Everyone will experience doubt. Everyone will experience offense. Everyone will have the experience of having their expectations of God and his kingdom unmet. We will all experience doubt and offense. We will all be in this position where we don't know what's going on and we'll have to manage our expectations the way that John did. And by the way, when I say all, I say all because if John the Baptist had this issue, then how much more will we have this issue? We have to be ready for it. John had it, and so will we. So when we're thrown off, when we're doubting, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. I hate to say it this way, but it's true. It is normal, and I'll explain why more as we go along. It's, it's, it's normal. It even happened to John, okay? That's the first thing we see. Next, John is reassured by Jesus. He is reassured in verses 4 through 6. Jesus responds to John by pointing him right back to the word. And I'm actually going to read what he said in verses 4 through 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report, this is the representatives going back to John, Go and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. What he's doing here, it's not, able, it's not obvious and apparent to see here, but what he's doing is he's referencing the book of Isaiah in particular, which speaks vividly and graphically about the way things are going to be in the messianic age when the kingdom of God is coming. And among the things that I, Isaiah describes over and over again is the deaf being able to hear, the lame being healed, the lepers cleansed, all these things. Uh, that was all spoken of in the Word of God. And so he's pointing them to saying, remember all that stuff uh, that you've been talking about, Isaiah? It's happening. Go and tell them that. Um, it was all part of the New Kingdom Age, and it was happening. So in other words, Jesus was basically confirming to John the Baptist that everything was going just as it was supposed to be. And that the promises of God's Word were not unmet. They were being fulfilled just as they said they would be. The only, thing that is, the only thing that is being unmet right now in, G, in John's life is his expectations. And the reason his expectations are being unmet is because his expectations were wrong. They were flawed. He had a picture in his mind about the way this was going to go down, and when it wasn't going down the way he thought, he got offended. But what Jesus was pointing out, it, the problem isn't the Word of God. The problem is that you just have a wrong picture of the way this is going to go down. When you go back to the Word of God and you look around, you see it's, it's happening exactly the way the Word said. You're just mistaken here. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. And we learn something from this. We learn that not everything that we think the Bible says is what it actually says. Can I say that? And maybe even resonate with some of you? I mean, I, it resonates with me very much because I had so many pictures in my mind of what the Bible said for so long. And so much of that has been deconstructed. It was never a problem with the Word of God. The Word of God remains true all along. The problem was my understanding of what it said. I was the one that had the misunderstanding. I was the one that had the problem. I had all kinds of ideas about God and His kingdom and the way it worked. They had nothing to do with what the Word of God actually said. They were developed personally or from ideas in the environment around me at the time. And part of me growing and, and, and walking with Him is having those things kind of... of kind of flushed out, you know, and you, you, if you go around, you'll talk to people that have all kinds of ideas about what God's Word says. For some people, uh, God's Word says all rock music is bad. You know, I was actually brought up in an environment that taught that all rock music was bad and evil and demonic and such things as that, and they were, they would use Scripture as an example of that. Um, there are people who believe that um, all alcohol is evil and everyone should abstain, you know, based upon the way that they believe the Word of God, and, or that if I tithe percent of 10% of my income faithfully and I'm in church every Sunday, I will be blessed 100% of the time. Th any number of things that, 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 uh, that people come to that are not necessarily what the Scripture says, but what they think it says, okay? Um, and this is how we get expectations that are off base. And when our expectations, which are off base, are not met, we have to go back to the Word of God with an open mind and, we, and a heart to discover what it actually says. And when we do this, we will inevitably discover that God's Word is still true, it was true all along, and it was our understanding of the Word of God that was flawed. 
And I want to just be clear, I, I, I think maybe many of you probably know people in this, in this situation, but there are so many people um, who were part of the church and involved in the church and in a big way, and then they totally walk away. You ever see that happen? Just walk away. What happened here? It's because something happened, and they became offended, and their expectations were not met. And instead of rather going humbly to God in his word and saying, help me to understand what's going on here, they just flushed it all out and said, God must not be true. They didn't even bother to check. They didn't even bother to dig in and find out what was going on. There are so many people that have walked away from the Lord that way. Having our expectations unmet is a normal, natural thing. But it can knock us completely off the rails, and we will fall away if we don't lean in at those moments and communicate with the Lord and dig into his word and figure out what it actually says. If we don't do that with a humble heart and open mind, we will fall away. And one of the big victories here for John the Baptist is that he didn't do that. He leaned in in this moment. Okay. Thirdly, I find this interesting. John is honored by Jesus. He's honored by Jesus. Now, we might be tempted to feel some disappointment towards John here. I know that in years past, probably, I'm, I'm not sure, I know in years past I would read through this and I would go, boy, that's, that's really off base. It's disappointing to see him finish so weak after such a strong ministry. It's kind of a, not a very stellar ending. But Jesus, in the midst of this situation, proceeds to honor John publicly. And if you'll notice, I'm not going to read these verses again, I already read them to you, but most of this text from verses 7 to 15 is devoted to Jesus praising and honoring and affirming John the Baptist, saying that he was the greatest prophet there ever was, even though, you know, even though he's saying those of us who entered the kingdom were even greater because there's a new age coming. He's like, there was never a prophet who ever lived like John. And Jesus is saying these things about John at this moment of crisis in his life where he's like, He's doubting, and he's saying, are you even the Messiah at all? At this moment, at this moment, Jesus is praising him and extolling him and honoring him that way. Interesting. Very interesting to see. We learn things here. What we learn is that it's not a sin to get offended. It's not a sin to be thrown off when your expectations are not met. It's not a deal breaker for you walking with the Lord. It happens. It's inevitable. Why? Because none of us possess a perfect knowledge of God. The only way to not get offended by what God is doing is to understand what God is doing. And all of us are imperfect and s small people. We, we can't even begin to understand the way he's thinking. So we're going to be offended. We're going to be thrown off. It's inevitable. You can't avoid it. Getting offended isn't the problem. Again, it's natural. It's what we do with those feelings of offense once they happen that makes or break us. And I'm going to say that again just so to make sure you hear me on this one. Getting offended, getting throw off, thrown off, even doubting, isn't the problem. The problem is what you do with those feelings once they happen. All right? John was experiencing doubt for understandable reasons. And what did he do in that situation? He leaned in. He reached out to Jesus. He asked for clarification. Help me to understand what's going on here because I don't get it anymore. And he got it. He got it by communicating and leaning in. And Jesus spends the remainder of this text contrasting John's correct response with that of the rest of the Jewish population. And that is also interesting. So again, John prevailed here because he leaned in when he doubted. And the rest of this text is, is, is designed to contrast what John did with what the majority of the Jewish nation was doing at that time. And we see that in verses 16 through 19. John is contrasted against his peers. I'm going to give you this portion again so that you can see it. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Jesus is making a point here, okay? 
His point is that the whole nation is offended by him because he's not meeting their expectations. And his point is that that in itself isn't the problem. The problem is that unlike John, who came to Jesus for clarification and understanding, they are distancing themselves from him and attacking him. Does that make sense? They're, doing, they're responding a different way. Rather than leaning in and asking for clarification, they are distancing themselves. They're isolating from him, and then they're lobbing grenades. They're attacking him. And their attacks, his point behind this, and I'll point this out in a minute, but his, the point he's making here is that their attacks are more feelings-based than they are facts-based. And that's what he's getting at when he says, you know, John came and he was austere and he was in the wilderness and they said he's a crazy dude, he's a, he has a demon. So the Son of Man comes and he's socializing and he's getting into people's homes and they say he's a drunkard and he's a friend of tax collectors and that kind of thing. I mean, they're preaching the same message. And Jesus is doing the exact the same thing that they were criticizing John for and they're just calling him names too. The point is it has nothing to do with facts. They're offended and so they're just criticizing everything that they do maliciously. He does this, it's wrong. He does the exact opposite, it's wrong. There's no winning. And it's because they're offended, and rather than leaning in for clarification, they're just lobbing grenades. No matter what you do, it's going to be wrong. You ever feel that way? No matter what I do, it's wrong. No matter what I do, it's wrong. The reason for that is because there's not communication happening. No one's leaning in. They're just lobbing grenades, and they're responding to feelings of threat and hurt. They're dealing with their unmet expectations the wrong way. And what we learn from this is that it is extremely, extremely spiritually harmful to, re to respond to these unmet expectations in this incorrect way. We are supposed to, in these times, reach out for clarification. We must never isolate ourselves and attack. And this works this way with our Heavenly Father. We are going to go through seasons in life. We are going to experience adversities and difficulties. And at those times, we're not going to understand what God is doing and why. And it's going to feel like our whole world is crashing down because things aren't working the way they're supposed to. And when that happens, the, the, the solution is not to withdraw from God's people, and to withdraw from God himself. It is to lean in, to pray, to consult the word, to commune with our fellow believers, and to humbly acknowledge the fact that maybe we were seeing things wrong, to unlearn the bad and to relearn the good. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but that's the way that you do it. That's the way that you overcome uh, and manage your expectations in, in terms of your relationship with God. But we have the same responsibility to do that with our fellow man. There are going to be times where we don't meet each other's expectations. Would you believe me if I told you that? There are going to be times where I don't do things the way you think I'm supposed to do them. And you don't do things the way that I'm supposed to do them. And one, you know, one way to handle this is for us to get irritated with each other and to start snipping each other behind their backs. You know? There's, the world's full of people that do that. Part of being the church is to show the kingdom way, a way that is different, a way that brings restoration and healing, and in order to do that, we have to be different. We have to chart a different path. And that means that when we do things that each other, that, that when we are doing things and we don't understand each other, we need to lean in. And we need to communicate. And we need to remember the example of Jesus here. Because when you look back, John leaned in when he didn't understand. And Jesus didn't get mad at him, right? You look at it sometimes and you think to yourself, well, may, may, maybe Jesus might have been a little irritated that after all this time you still don't get it or something like that. No, he met his need immediately. He didn't get angry with him. He even honored him because he was responding correctly. And we need to be that same way with each other. When someone has the courage to come to us and say, I don't understand why you're doing that, the right response is not to snip at them and to tell them to be quiet and shut up and go away. The right response is to honor that person, to honor what they're trying to do and try to form a dialogue with them. Usually, most of the time, the greatest friendships we have are the kind of friendships that um, overcome unmet expectations and work through them and come out the other side. Um, it's, just a, it's just a basic principle there. So we have the responsible to manage our expectations with God. 
we also have the responsibility to manage our expectations with our fellow man. And when we do these things, uh, we will be leaning into God's kingdom because God is doing new things and exciting things, and they are better for us, and they are better for the world, and they are better for the church. And the only way we can be a part of them is if we don't get thrown off when things are happening that aren't working the way we think they're supposed to. We've got to manage our expectations from time to time. Well, that said, let's pray. And let's ask God to help us to do that. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you so much uh, for the example that you set. Um, and we thank you that at the top of it all is you and your kingdom, which is never changing. There is no adjustment on your end. But we also acknowledge that on our end of things, our knowledge is limited. As the word says, behold, we see through a glass dimly. Uh, to acknowledge that is wise. And help us, Lord Jesus, to be able to see when we misunderstand and to adjust accordingly. But to remain firm and true to the things that are true at the same time. Lord, that is a very difficult path to walk. And it can only be walked with your spirit illuminating it for us. And so we pray for that help now. We ask these things in Jesus' name.